Now I would like I would like to continue with our next panel, and I would like to pass the word to my partner uh, and co-founder of Flashpoint, Michael. Michael, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, very nice to see you all. Uh, I am one of the general partners uh, of Flashpoint uh, and one of the founders together with Alex. And uh, we will start uh, today's uh, next panel, uh, which is called International Financial Institutions in European Tech. Uh, obviously, uh, financial institutions in any ecosystem play a very, very important role. Uh, and we thought that it will be amazing if we can uh, present uh, some important building blocks uh, from our European community uh, to everyone. Uh, and, um, you know, with this, uh, I hope to uh, see my fellow members on this panel, uh, Dinesh and, uh, and Malgor Chata. Thank you for joining. Uh, we're still waiting uh, for some additional members, but uh, I think uh, maybe uh, since you guys are already here, uh, we should start with a, with a round of introductions. And uh, equally important, I think that uh, apart from introducing yourself, it would be also great if you spoke a little bit about uh, your organization uh, and its experience uh, in uh, investing uh, into tech uh, in Europe. Uh, so, um, Maldor Chata, let me start with you. Okay. Uh, Good uh, afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting us uh, to this panel. Um, PFR Ventures is one of the, I think, startup uh, among uh, international financial institutions in Europe. Um, we started uh, in 2016, our operations. Uh, since then, we have invested in uh, more than 40 uh, venture capital and private equity funds um, in Poland, in Europe, and um, globally. Um, we are uh, a part of Polish Development Fund institution, um, which is a developing institution, and we are a venturing arm, um, and it was established uh, as I said, six, uh, almost seven years uh, ago. So we have uh, been uh, uh, trying to introduce into the Polish market best practices uh, from all over the world. Um, we were looking at EIF, uh, we were looking at EPRD, we were closely collaborating with them uh, to not to open the doors, you know, which are already open and also trying to accommodate as much as possible uh, into the Polish market. We were not trying to be um, conformist, uh, so we were very um, picky in terms of uh, the uh, proposals. And at the beginning, we, um, we encountered a lot of uh, critics from the market, which was used to uh, grants in the past or huge preferences in terms of the private investors and GPs. Uh, but uh, finally, I, th I, th I think we can say that after six years uh, being so active, we can say that uh, uh, it's much better uh, and uh, everybody uh, today understands uh, that uh, market standards are one. Uh, so th that we don't have to build our own Polish uh, market standards, that it exists in Europe and globally. And all we have to do is to accommodate, sometimes a little bit customize. Me, myself, I'm uh, here from the very beginning, from uh, 2016. Before that, I was running my, uh, I had, to, I was a founder of uh, uh, two um, um, GPs uh, here in Poland. Before that, I was, um, connected. I was working for United Nations, uh, mainly abroad for almost five years. I was also managing IT company um, here in Poland uh, when I was 20 something. So I was the youngest uh, woman uh, in uh, IT society. And it was a company which was listed on Warsaw um, Stock Exchange. So that's excellent. It. Thank you. Amazing introduction. Uh, Danish, uh, I would like to ask you to also introduce yourself and, and SDA, which plays an important role in our ecosystem. Well, we 
plan to play an important role <laughs> in your ecosystem. That's true. Um, hi, uh, nice to meet you all. Um, Sage and Funds uh, was set up uh, like 11 years ago by the Hungarian government. And uh, uh, most of the time it, uh, it was owned by the, or managed uh, by the finance ministry. Uh, the main goal was, of course, as uh, it was set up as a relatively small uh, fund manager with a, a relatively small fund, a couple of uh, uh, 10 million euros. Uh, and then uh, by now we are managing 400 million euros and uh, investing uh, uh, much larger companies, uh, uh, no longer startups, but uh, much, much more mature companies. And why I'm here on the panel <laughs> is because we have also uh, started investing uh, uh, into uh, funds itself. Uh, we are not so focused on to tech. So uh, if there is a tech opportunity, then of course we look at it and we have uh, tech investments, but we are not uh, as focused as like uh, uh, Flashpoint is. And uh, we have uh, uh, started also investments abroad and uh, Hello. looking at inter Hi, Bjorn. Hi. Hi, Bjorn. Sorry for being a bit late. No, that's okay. No worries. Okay. Happens to the best of us. And we have uh, um, also um, uh, investments, uh, or we are or planning to have investments uh, abroad. Um, it's still important. Uh, uh, to have uh, some gain for the Hungarian economy. Uh, so for Hungarians to build businesses abroad. You don't or... hear me? We can hear you, Bjorn. Thank we you. can hear you well. I don't hear you. Um... Ah. Okay, now it does. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, as for myself, I'm running this fund uh, uh, for two years. I've been on the board for four. Now it will be three years that I'm running it. Uh, and uh, since then, there were quite significant changes, uh, both in strategy, both on, in headcount and, uh, and the team itself. Uh, for myself, I've, I, I started as a uh, computer guy, so as a software engineer. Uh, and then afterwards, I ran uh, a couple of telco companies. Uh, so that's basically my background, though I was also working for the government because I was... Uh, uh, VP for or, or CIO uh, for the Hungarian Treasury uh, at the time. Mm -hmm. So that's my background. Excellent. Thank you, Danish. Bjorn, you joined uh, at the right time. We're going through a round of introductions. Mm -hmm. So maybe if you can say a couple of words about yourself, but also about uh, the role that your institution plays in sort of the European tech ecosystem. Yeah. So on, on myself, I'm Bjorn Tremery. Um, I've been with the European Investment Fund for uh, 20 years this year. I'm responsible for the um, tech investment activities uh, at the European Investment Fund. Um, the European Investment Fund is the largest investor in innovation and technology in, in Europe. Uh, we're operating under a fund of fund model. So we don't invest directly in companies. We invest in venture capital funds that then in turn invest in, in, in startups across the European continent. So. Um, we uh, last year invested 3 billion in European venture funds in over 120 transactions. So it was, it was a record year. Um, and we've, we've seen European venture really developing from um, yeah, an ugly duckling of the asset class into, into something that is really light now. Uh, and Europe has, has become relevant on the global scene uh, as, as a tech innovation continent as well. EIF uh, wants to help and contribute to that development by investing in emerging teams, established teams as well, even blue chip teams, but also going increasingly into new thematics, be it climate, be it cyber, uh, be, be it uh, specific AI verticals of the software industry. So that's that's a bit what we do. Um, before EIF, I was active in a in globally active uh, European venture capital uh, fund um, uh, was the first investor in Shazam, for instance, next to two other institutional investors there. Uh, I started my career in 97 at, uh, in investment banking at ING Bearings. 
Excellent. Thank you, Bjorn. Maybe the first question that I wanted to ask uh, to, to, to some of you is about uh, software as a service, because after all, our conference today is devoted to software as a service. Uh, so, uh, Mangarshat, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, maybe uh, if you can uh, uh, tell us about uh, PFR's views on this sort of uh, niche within, uh, within tech, uh, and, uh, you know, if you've supported any managers which focus exclusively on software as a service and how do you believe, uh, you know, software as a service uh, will uh, develop. But it will also be interesting to see how you think about uh, industries uh, in general and, you know, whether you, uh, when you do invest into funds, uh, whether you dive deeply into an understanding of, uh, you know, what industries uh, specifically they are running after within the global tech mm -hmm. ecosystem. Well, um, I can um, share the data from 2020 and 2021. The software as a service investment projects accounted for 40% uh, of all the investments that our, our VC funds um, did. Um, we don't look at uh, software as a service as a as a as a niche or as an industry um we think and we don't look deeply in terms of um uh, evaluating the gps what they invest in we rather look at the experience of the of the gp and the strategy they have if it is a match a good match or not um, me myself, I believe in SaaS uh, very strongly. I invested in uh, SaaS in 2015. Uh, and now it's Booksy, so uh, because it's um, uh, it was the fusion. So I think that it's one of the um, most predictable business model in uh, in uh, tech um, uh, ecosystem uh, and measurable. Uh, so this is my opinion, but uh, we do not do any intervention in terms of the investment strategy when it comes to, uh, to the GP. We more focus on um, industry. So for instance, we created uh, a Green Hub Fund of Funds, uh, which I had the privilege to, to manage uh, last year. And it's uh, climate tech um, um, strategy. So we choose uh, only the VC uh, from global ecosystem, uh, but Polish also, which have a very strong uh, climate tech strategy. So it's not only impact or ESG, but uh, clearly uh, climate tech um, uh, investment strategy. So this is what we are looking for. So uh, the software as a service, uh, we see that uh, there are a lot of investments. However, we do not uh, um, judge or evaluate the GPs um, in terms of, uh, of the strategy, if they have SaaS strategy or marketplace uh, or other. Yeah. Understood. Thank you. Bahram, thank you very much for joining us as well. Uh, very good to see you. Uh, uh, we've... Uh, uh, no, no worries. We've uh, just uh, finished our round of introductions, so maybe if, if you can introduce uh, yourself and also the the role uh, that uh, you know you uh, and the the part uh, of the organization where you're in that you manage plays uh, in in the European tech ecosystem. Sure. So I uh, I run the direct VC business for EDRD. We started direct VC business at EDRD uh, now about 12 years ago. And uh, the way how we run it is basically by the internal, internal funds. Today we invest out of the fund three. It's a 250 million euros fund to invest directly into technology companies, starting from series A to kind of growth equity. So all the stages except for the, uh, for the seed stage. And we invest in companies incorporated, uh, well, companies uh, which operated across the countries where DRD operates, right? Obviously, kind of uh, besides besides the direct business, uh, EDRD is also very active investing in the fund of funds. So EDRD kind of addresses that technology sector by the fund of funds and also direct investments. 
Thank you, Bahram. Next question uh, is uh, is for Bjorn. Uh, you know, given given where you are and sort of given uh, how events in general in the markets and the public markets and the private markets and the ecosystem are unfolding. Uh, I would want to sort of quiz you on uh, the benefits that you see for founders in sort of choosing the European uh, ecosystem as opposed to the US ecosystem. Uh, because, I mean, today founders can easily relocate and essentially start businesses wherever they would like uh, around the globe, uh, right? Uh, you, they, they, your they, mission. Sorry, just to finish, your mission is to support the European ecosystem. So I'm sure you would want them to choose Europe as opposed to the US, right? So what, what do you think are the benefits and, uh, you know, the current events, have they affected in any way this choice? Yeah, well, but b before thinking that the, the, the entrepreneurs uh, that we would like to attract uh, can only come from other continents, on continents than the European Union, I would, uh, I think for us, it's already a success currently with the work that has been done by the, the national uh, players like PFR, but also EIF and EBRD, that we've actually managed to make Europe a good place to start your business. So we, we, we tend to forget that there's like five to 600 million Europeans living on the continent here. 20 years ago, um, the only option they had if they wanted to become an entrepreneur uh, because of lack of funding was to go outside of Europe. Now, at least the entrepreneurial talent that we have here now does not need to look abroad anymore because you have the tools and the financing schemes in place, at least to start up your business. So there, I think I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of how Europe has developed itself into a continent where out of sheer need, you don't need to relocate and go to the US because you would not find the, the, the money uh, for, for, for the startup you, you wanted to create. One of the biggest success stories that Europe has had uh, in, 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 in technology and in, in, in software is, is uh, UiPath, which was coming out of Romania. It may have flipped at the later moment in time to, to, to the US, but basically nothing prevented um, a successful company to, to be born in, in Europe. I think what, what is... What has contributed to that, uh, I, th I think the fact that we have now role models, people that show that you can be a successful entrepreneur, coupled with the necessity to have money as well. It's good to have money that supports an entrepreneur, but if I always say you can put the Lego blocks in the playroom, but if the children don't want to play with it, you're not going to see any constructions and, and nice, nice results. The same here, you can put the money in the system, but if nobody wants to become an entrepreneur, um, the money is not going to land anywhere. So here we have managed to, to bring uh, to, to Europe an entrepreneurial spirit coupled with the money that the, the public sector has provided, but increasingly also also the, 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 the private sector. Um, some people don't want to really co relocate, believe it or not. It's not because uh, in other continents, it's, it's, it's easy to move from or, or more common to move from uh, from New York to Silicon Valley and vice versa. Um, not certain that everybody wants to bring their family from Portugal to um, to, to Berlin, just to, to name two cities. So uh, the good thing is currently you can see that you, it's as easy to set up your company in in Berlin as it is in in in, uh, in Lisbon. So that's something that that Europe offers its diversity. I think increasingly uh, there's also visa schemes in place that allow non-European uh, talent to come in and and to actually tap into this increasingly attractive. Um, environment. We have shown now over the last 10 years that we generate returns and big companies as well. Uh, and you can do it. At least you, you, you're you now offered a choice. If you're coming from outside of Europe, outside of the US, you can choose whether you want to go into um, the US, probably more for lifestyle than as well. Um, you can go into the very competitive Silicon Valley environment, or you can find very good, talented uh, investors as well in a less competitive European environment that also can bring you, at least for the first stages of your, your company, um, to, to, to almost a global level. We have to realize in Europe that there's still one thing missing. If ultimately you, you will need your large Series C, D, E round, you will be dependent on non-European money because that's not present there. And at one moment in time, that non-European money, mostly US one, will result that you probably need to flip your company to, to, to the US. But at least for the risk taking part, you're not dependent anymore on, 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 um, on moving outside of Europe. That's good to hear actually, that there is, as you're saying, much more money in Europe now available sort of at the early stage, at series A, series B, seed stage uh, for founders and for companies. Uh, and, you know, definitely 
uh, your organization, uh, but also a number of other uh, institutions in, in Europe have been working a lot in order to make this happen. Uh, and maybe Bahram, sort of to switch back to you, uh, EBRD has also started sort of a direct investment program, right? So it would be very interesting to see uh, what are the benefits that, that EBRD sees for itself in, in having, uh, you know, such a program. Um, and now that you've been doing it super successfully for, you know, a decade, uh, how do you yourself evaluate sort of the results and, and the way forward? Yes, it's kind of uh, the way how EBRD looks at that is that there are a number of different products, right, tools, uh, how to develop technology ecosystem uh, in the countries where EBRD operates, kind of primarily Eastern Europe and Northern Africa, right? And uh, when we started, when we started that in 12 years ago, uh, you know, one of the, kind of, we, we set our, ourselves a number of the, um, a number of targets, Right, and one of them was what's kind of from the impact investing, what's called the demonstration effect. Right, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to demonstrate actually that you can build a successful direct investing VC business in uh, in the countries in the kind of more developing countries of Eastern Europe and, uh, and and Northern Africa, and that's kind of that's that's what that that was one of the key uh, key features is uh, really. Putting out that you can you can build successful direct VC business and at the same time support some of the early um, early success stories, or early or potential success stories that can that can kind of come out of the out of the region. And so far, yes, so far, kind of right now we're investing out of the kind of the internal pocket three, which is 250 million euros. But uh, the first one we started in 2011 was 100 million euros uh, internal funds and uh, out of that we had uh, three unicorns and uh, kind of the the whole portfolio seemed to be continue to be performing quite well very good to hear that maybe the next question danish is is for you because your organization is uh, and you yourself, your role even, I should say, within your organization is unique, that you both support funds and companies directly uh, from SDA, right? So I wanted to ask you sort of, uh, how do you decide when to support companies and what is the difference in your strategy in terms of supporting companies directly uh, on one hand, right? And on the other hand, in, in supporting funds, do you see these activities competing in some way or do you see them working synergistically together well i hope i hope it will work synergistically together and uh, <clears throat> there is no different strategy the strategy is the same to make money so uh, if you invest into a separate company then of course you take uh, a much larger risk uh, regarding that company but you have a much higher uh, opportunity benefit if you uh, if we when we invest into a fund uh, then there, what we see is expertise. Um, we only invest uh, with uh, with uh, into a fund which has excellent uh, uh, track record. By the way, you might know we have an investment together with the IF and the EBRD uh, into a fund, uh, which is Euro Ventures, uh, one of the uh, oldest Hungarian uh, funds, and we hope it will be a very good investment. It's their fourth round. Um, what we see, for example, when we are uh, looking at uh, uh, Flashpoint uh, as a potential uh, possible partner, uh, is is uh, the expertise that you have on the market, uh, Vichy, uh, the type of uh, know-how which uh, which we don't have in-house, and the the at the same time also the opportunity. Uh, to understand uh, a bit more the entire European ecosystem, because from the, at the beginning we have been logged into Hungary. Right now we are looking at a much broader uh, uh, playground, and uh, of course also uh, the possibility to co-invest uh, in in certain cases when there is the possibility to co-invest. Understood. That's actually an excellent lead-in for the next question. Uh, which I wanted to direct to Bahram. We have a, a lot of founders in the audience today listening, right? And I think many of them would like to understand how different it is to deal with a VC, uh, with a VC manager, 
and uh, with an organization like like yours, essentially with an IFI, which has a VC arm. Uh, so, Bakrom, you as a person who, who understands also how VCs work, can you tell us about the differences in your approach to investing and, you know, your process, your analysis uh, for a company uh, to a traditional VC? Yeah, so kind of when we started that, our, one of our main goals was to be as, uh, as close as possible to the market practice, right, to be kind of uh, best, best market practice. So in terms of how we work with entrepreneurs, we try not to be in any way different to other market players, right? And especially when we started this, this, this effort kind of, at that point in time, there were not that many, if any, kind of professional venture investors focusing on Eastern Europe. And what we saw actually, there were kind of a number of the, a number of the players uh, which were interested in the kind of tech early stage businesses, but there were also examples of the investors who were, who were behaving more like the private equity funds, right? And uh, kind of uh, really, I think, uh, our goal was to, to really bring the um, kind of more best practice venture capital business. So I, what I'm basically, what I'm saying is our goal is actually to uh, support, support um, entrepreneurs yeah, uh, within the within the parameters of the market practice, and I think kind of the main differences where you would see probably at the edges we are kind of more sensitive towards some of the uh, some of the issues which can be related to reputation, right? So, for example, kind of there are some of the sectors that we kind of try to avoid. You know, one example being uh, you know gaming could be one example. Besides the fact that it is uh, a kind of heat driven business business model. That some of the content may not be may not be really suitable in terms of uh, in terms of what, what the bank says, but otherwise uh, otherwise kind of we we try to we try to be we try to be a kind of player playing the market together together with other uh, venture uh, venture financing providers. Understood. Maybe this is a good time to move on uh, to sort of discussing your competition, I suppose, which is the the VC funds. And uh, Malgo Chata, you are uh, one of the champions in terms of investing into, into funds uh, on our panel. Uh, so I wanted to ask you sort of how do you formulate the benefits for, for yourself, for PFR, in terms of preferring investing into funds uh, than, uh, you know, investing directly? And why did your organization decide that it is exclusively supporting funds uh, and not direct investments? Well, I think we are not there yet. Uh, we are a very young organization. This is one point. Um, six years old, it's um, still very um, beginning of the school uh, child. So um, it's not that we uh, haven't done a uh, lot, but we are still, uh, we still do not want to mix the role of the investor and uh, GP. And uh, for us uh, and for the Polish market, which is also very young, I mean, I have uh, invested, I have created the, one of the first, or the first maybe, uh, fund, uh, VC funds um, um, where, the, where there was a big show of public yeah. and money in 2007. So it was not that, uh, and it was one of the first VC funds. Uh, uh, we, uh, in those days, we had two VC funds. MCI and BBI, uh, BBI. So if you look at this perspective, we are still, uh, maybe not at the very beginning, but uh, at the beginning, early stage, right? Um, so uh, we decided to focus on VC funds and uh, we do not only, um, um, well, I don't think we are the main beneficiary. <laughs> the main, be uh, the, the uh, who, who, this is the country and the uh, society who should be um, who should benefit from what we are doing. So for us, it's uh, we have a mission to educate not only uh, tech uh, society or VC society. We are talking with the public institutions. We are educating public institutions because they are managing also the funding we are receiving. We are deploying uh, to the VCs. So it's very important, and we see the huge progress uh, um, uh, comparing to what we were talking uh, six years ago. 
because Polish market were really was really um, 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 like grants uh, um, market. So the the GPs were very um, uh, were used to uh, used to grants. The the equity didn't exist uh, ten years ago. Mm. So this is uh, this is this is what we are doing. We are not only educating uh, tech uh, ecosystem. We are educating first of all institutions, public institutions, and LPs, because our mission is to mobilize as many private capital as possible. And it's still um, crawling. It's not uh, it's not mature. Um, so we are trying to act not only as a as a deployment of the funds, but we are doing many different um, uh, events and uh, um, we are creating actually uh, organization within Polish Development Fund Group, um, uh, which are helping us uh, with startups, with, uh, um, with um, uh, um, uh, science work uh, to compile, you know, all those um, ecosystems small micro ecosystems into one uh, place so we think uh, m maybe not the same because it's not uh, healthy but we know the benchmark we know what uh, the standard market means yeah understood thank you bjorn maybe the last question sort of uh, in today's panel uh, goes to you and uh, because you have a lot of experience in fund investing and i know that there are also a lot of fund managers in our audience today would like to understand what are the main criteria for you uh, for fund selection uh, in terms of team, geography, other criteria that you look at. And also an important add-on question is if you guys support emerging managers, first-time funds, what is your view on sort of emerging managers? Let me start immediately with the, 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 the last part. Yes, we do. Emerging managers is actually one of our, our main reasons for existence it's uh, it's to operate in markets where uh, the market is not yet as developed um so uh, if we if we are operating in a region uh, where there's no emerging manager and um, we can invest in that emerging manager but i also would have the opportunity to invest in in an established manager uh, number 10 in a developed region time priority wise we would go with the emerging manager in in an underdeveloped region so it, it is what we do um, that doesn't mean once we have supported an emerging manager to become an established or even blue chip manager that we stop the relationship. But most of the mandates, I would say 70, 80 percent of what we what we get as funding from the European Commission, for instance, is really to, to, to bring um, emerging managers to the table. Then linking that to the to, to the, the question, what do we look at? So uh, normally from from myself or from the team members here, you would never hear that. Um, it's a reason to be turned down that you're a first-time manager. It may be that you're not the right first-time manager. And then we go into the general way we look at, at, at teams. Um, and I, I would go more into the details of the DNA than just checking that the, the, the mandate uh, requirements that we have are, are, are matching. If there's a, an Asian fund knocking on our door, wanting to know whether we're going to invest in a in an Indian or, or a, or a Chinese-focused uh um, uh, fund that is not for us, we're the European investment fund, so those we filter out quite rapidly. But assuming that you're having in front of you a proposal to invest in a European focused uh, fund, uh, new team or not new team, uh, we would really look at the quality of the team, their track record, uh, the, the, the possibility for them to to be sustainable, have, it, have the right infrastructure, uh, work together over 10 15 years. It's a long term play, uh, even a first time team normally will have to work together for 10 years plus if they want to sit out the whole um, divestment period of the fund as well and hopefully raise new funds in, in, in between. Second important element is alignment of interest. We want to be aligned. If you're making money, uh, we want to be making money and vice versa. So it cannot be that we're overpaying on the, on the management fee and, 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 and risk that we give you a comfortable life and we are at risk of not getting a return. So we, we do budget analysis. Uh, we, we look for team commitments as well. Typically, the 1% is not team alignment. We've seen uh, we're more on the 2 to 3%. That doesn't mean that we don't accept lower, but just in terms of alignment of interest, conflicts of interest as well, we want uh, 
to be certain that the only asset that we can do diligence on is actually is actually in safe hands. We only we also want independent uh, managers, so managers that are not owned by a corporate, uh, by uh, by a, by a family, and uh, actually the family members are not the ones with the investment expertise. So um, we, we just want to make certain that everything is in, in sync. Also, the fund parameters need to be good. If you're wanting to raise a billion fund to do pre-seed investments, it's not going to work. Uh, the same mm -hmm. thing if you're going to raise a 50 million fund to do Series C investments. Yeah, you probably cannot write a, a single ticket with a 50 million uh, fund. Uh, no, that Series CDs typically, uh, they, yeah, they sometimes go 50, they start at 50 million, so to speak. So this all needs to be in sync. And only then, it's important, but only then uh, we would start looking at the legals as well and make certain that the yeah, the, the protection mechanisms are in place, in place as well. But we're not going to negotiate the price of the house if we're not certain we like the house, so to speak. Just in a nutshell, we'd be open to take any questions from you as well to see if there's one particular uh, uh, argument that you want to tackle more. But it's, it, it's almost more psychology than... Um, than number crunching because first-time teams don't always have a track record that they can show. The individuals may have a track record and then it's it's referencing and speaking to people they've supported. Yeah, uh, PFR can probably yeah. Yeah, they're I doing agree. the same. Job. I mean, I agree fully. What uh, have you said? Uh, we 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 mainly look at people and uh, their previous experience because we mainly invest in emerging uh, managers. Uh, I think that uh, eighty percent, or maybe eighty-five, uh, out of our uh, all uh, VC uh, funds are uh, first-time teams. So some of them they uh, they got money from uh, National uh, Development um, uh, Fund uh, established in two thousand and five, uh, but it's like maybe few uh, four or five, um, and we hope that in uh, beginning from two thousand twenty-three. We will be able to uh, invest in uh, in our managers, uh, you know, in uh, in the second in the second fund. Uh, but for us, what is the most important is uh, honesty and uh, and people. And uh, if uh, they don't have a track record, because usually they don't, uh, we are trying. Of course, skin in the game and commitment is important. And one percent is not enough. Um, of course, in the in the programs where we have preferences, mm -hmm. uh, it's a completely different uh, story. But uh, we want uh, people, you know, to be honest, and we expect that they will deliver what they promise. Guys, I would like to thank you very much uh, for not just your participation in today's panel, but actually for all the work that you're doing for the ecosystem, both on the direct investment side, but also on the fund investment side. I mean, you know, as uh, Working in the ecosystem myself now for about 15 years, I can say that the development that has happened in Europe uh, has been definitely huge. It's a completely different world uh, and it's wonderful to see. And it's wonderful to see that your organizations are not just engaging, but are devoted to actually changing our ecosystem uh, to the better. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I very much hope that the next, uh, this decade is going to be very successful for, for European tech. And surely, you know, also for the region where we, we focus, Central and Eastern Europe uh, and Israel. Uh, and uh, with this, uh, uh, you know, let's uh, wrap up uh, today's panel. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you your support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.